everyone. Thanks for joining us at the Haunted Cafe. My name is Amber, and today we are going to continue talking about the Haunted Boynton Oak Tree, which is located just outside of the Church Street Graveyard in Mobile, Alabama. So grab a drink and a comfy chair because we have a spooky tale to tell. But first, before we talk about our spooky tale, I'm going to talk about the drink that I recommend. And today is another stash tea and it is Moroccan mint. It's a green tea and its ingredients are green tea, spearmint, lemongrass, and peppermint. And honestly, just by the smell of it, all you smell is the peppermint and it smells so good. So if you're interested in the tea, there's a link down in the description box below. And yeah, hopefully you, hopefully you enjoy it. All right. So when we left you last, a man named Nathaniel Frost was found murdered in the cemetery where he was last seen picking blackberries with a man named Charles Boyington. On that very same day, Charles decided that he needed to skip town because of his financial situation in Alabama. And it was just getting way too, you know, out of control. When Nathaniel's body was discovered, people knew that Charles was the last person to see him alive. And so... Charles was tracked down and arrested for the murder. Um, they had his preliminary trial in which they decided to move forward with convicting Charles. Uh, if you remember, his preliminary trial wasn't really that great. Um, they didn't really give him a chance to like speak his thoughts or like his uh, side of the story, I guess. And, you know... He, did, he just didn't have an opportunity to plead his case. So it was almost like he was giving a guilty verdict, even though they only had, like, what they thought was the truth, if that makes sense. But So fast forward to November 3rd to when they picked jur jurors for this trial. Uh, Isaac Irwin, which was one of Charles's lawyers, um, and he, he's there. <laughs> during this, you know, picking of the jury. And he's supposed to make sure that none of these jury people, like these members, uh, already have, like, a guilty verdict against Charles. These men that were to be in this jury box were supposed to be good and lawful, lawful men, meaning that they were willing to listen to the evidence first before deciding the verdict. But that was not the case for probably at least two of the men who were actually selected to be jurymen. One man was a man named George Davis Jr. Um, now, it was, it's not said that George was against Charles in any way, but the jury was supposed to be made up of men who actually lived in the states, not the United States, but the states, had to live in Alabama. Um, and of course, George did not. George was a British citizen, meaning that he shouldn't have been even allowed to sit in as a juror or, you know, to have any kind of um, say in whether or not Charles was guilty. Uh, only people who lived in the state could be a juror. And on top of George being there when he shouldn't have, there was another man named Chandler Waldo, who was a man who said publicly that he would convict Charles no matter what evidence was laid out in front of him. Basically, like, he just wanted to see Charles hung no matter what. Um, Irwin, the lawyer, just kind of let these guys be picked as jurors. He didn't object until the following day, probably when Charles found out about these people, and nothing ended up becoming of this. Like, you know what I mean? Nothing happened. These two men just continued to be jurors until the very end. So, Charles himself tried to plead for an abatement because he wanted to say that the court didn't write his correct name. Like, they pretty much wanted, you know, he wanted, uh, not necessarily like a retry, but I feel like, I think an abatement is basically, let me look it up actually. Pause. So, an abatement is the act of reducing or nullifying something. So, I think pretty much what Charles was trying to say was that because they, like, spelled his name incorrectly, supposedly, um, he wanted 
the charges to either be dropped or like I guess redone or like maybe jurors to be repicked somehow um I'm not sure what that would have exactly done for him but he said that his proper name was Charles R.S. Boyington but they had just used Charles Boyington and obviously the court rejected this he then tried to prove that the two men on the jury weren't good and lawful men due to the issues I stated above. And while this was true, honestly, like the one guy was from Britain and the other one had a clear, like, you know, disdain for Charles, um, this, like, abatement was rejected for some reason, too. Um, it sounds like the prosecutors knew that Charles could have gotten an abatement for those two men, but it sounds like Charles and his lawyers waited too long to object. Like, they should have objected as soon as they found out that these guys, you know, weren't good and lawful men, <laughs> you know? So, but for now, Charles had to wait for his trial. He was arraigned and he pleaded not guilty. November 20th was the day of the trial. There isn't a whole lot of information about the trial itself, but I will point out some key elements about it. First, the prosecution actually did research. They looked for witnesses who saw Charles and Nathaniel together. They found a young man named William Moore, who said that he had seen the two men together walking on Dolphin Street at around 3.30 to 4 p.m. on the day of the murder. But Charles would say later that yes, he and Frost had walked on Dolphin Street that day, but it had been in the morning. He also stated that if he and Frost had been walking on the street at that time, it was still way out of the way of the graveyard. Like, it's not in, like, the complete opposite direction, but it's not close to the graveyard. Check out that map on Facebook if you want to see more. <laughs> or see what I'm talking about. So... The next testimony was from Mr. Smith, who is the stable owner that Charles rented a horse from. He said that Charles had only visited the stable two times, once at 3.30 p.m. and then again later on in the evening. He said that the first time he was there, Charles was buying a horse for the very next day. The second time he arrived at the stable, Charles seemed to be in a hurry and was wanting to rent the horse right then and there, but then was disappointed to find out that the horse he had requested had been sent to the races that day. This statement made it look like Charles was all, you know, all of a sudden in a rush to leave, right around the time of Nathaniel's murder. According to Charles' statement, he had visited the stable three times, once in the morning to buy the horse for the next day, and then two more times, like I stated in the first episode. Um... It was said that the defense didn't really push on Mr. Smith too much. Like, they didn't try questioning him a bunch because he was supposedly sick at the time. So, like, they didn't really get it, get as much evidence as they probably could have from him. They just kind of asked really basic questions, you know. Which I think is funny that it was just like, oh, you're sick? All right, well, we won't ask you questions. You're sick, <laughs> you know? It's weird. So, the defense also questioned Taylor about him trying to bargain with Charles's freedom. Uh, he was quoted as saying, I asked the prisoner what he would give me if I were to let him go. Which just means that Taylor was trying to somehow prove Charles's guilt. I guess he figured that if Charles accepted the chance to escape, then that meant he had something to escape from. And while the, the the defense was trying to say that Charles was under duress while Taylor prodded him for bribe money, the jury didn't really seem to care. All they saw was a man who was potentially wanting to escape and someone who seemed to know something about stolen about passing stolen money. They saw a criminal and an outsider because remember Charles was not originally from Alabama. He was from the north. So he was kind of a stranger as far as people were concerned. So while the prosecutors seemed to be doing a better job of getting Charles convicted than the defense, defense proving the opposite, there were some obvious holes in their case. First, why would a murderer who was so 
desperate trying to leave town, like, so quickly, uh, talk to so many people. I mean, he brought a horse back to the stable after already riding off with it. Like, I understand that it's a bad ride, I guess, but he was already on his way out of town. Like, just keep going until you could find something better. Also, no one saw Charles with blood-stained clothes, and it seems like he wouldn't have had time to change. Because um, no one saw him with, like, a spare change of clothes or anything like that. So he wouldn't have been able to sneak into that, the boarding house, drenched with blood, and be able to change when nobody saw him. Like, I feel like that's almost impossible. Now, depending on the stab wounds and stuff like that, because we don't have, like, an autopsy or, you know... I don't even know if they did an autopsy back then. Um, I don't know how much blood or anything like that would have ended up on the killer's clothes. Um, but if it did get a little messy, how would he have been able to hide that mess? Because it's not just going to get on your clothes. It's going to get on your, your body, your skin too. So for him to have done something in a graveyard and then be able to be completely clean is just... It's To me, it seems a little impossible, but I don't know. Well, Charles's defense lawyers should have brought all this up. They should have been trying to instill a reasonable doubt into the minds of the jury. But it doesn't seem like they did that. It just seems like they kind of sat back and hoped. I guess that they would. they hoped that the jury would see Charles was innocent somehow. I mean, they really didn't try and prove it at all. Um... My my theory is that the lawyers themselves probably didn't think he was innocent, so they didn't really try hard enough to prove otherwise. Like, they didn't think he was innocent, so they weren't going to try and prove it. And, like, they were appointed to him as well, so it's not like he was paying them to help him out. So, one piece of evidence to prove that a lot of people thought he was guilty was the fact that all of these witnesses that showed up during the preliminary trial either didn't show up this time or they changed their stories completely. No one knows for sure why they didn't show up or why they changed their story. Um, it could have been a case of intimidation or it could have just been that their thoughts on Charles had changed. Uh, either way, that was definitely not a good look for him. On Friday, November 21st, 1834, at midnight, the trial was finished. The jury deliberated for an hour and 15 minutes before bringing in a guilty verdict. On November 28th, Charles was brought back into the courtroom and sentenced by a, name na a man named Judge Chapman. And he was sentenced to hang on February 20th, 1835. He did plead his innocence. And he did plead for a retrial and for his freedom. What's odd, though, is that Judge Chapman wondered if maybe Charles's arguments about the jury being unfit way before the trial were correct. And if so, he decided to let the Supreme Court handle this, which realistically gave Charles a sense of hope. So while Charles waited for this new determination, he almost acted as if he was going to get out of this. He spent his time in prison writing poetry, talking to Rose de Fleur, and writing pieces, writing a piece that he would later call his statement. This statement was basically his written out version of what happened on the day of the murder of Nathaniel Frost and afterwards. He didn't necessarily write about the trial or anything, just literally like what he did the day of. Um, I personally couldn't find the statement, um, like, a copy of the statement to read myself. Uh, if anybody actually does have a copy of the statement, I would love to read it. I would love to read his side of the story and, like, the way he wrote it, but I could not find it. So, I don't really know what it says. Um, so the Supreme Court heard Charles's case on February 11th, 1835. This trial was basically to see if Charles really had missed the opportunity to object to the jurors uh, that was there, like, during his previous trial, or if he was within his legal rights to object to them now. And honestly, it did sound like his lawyers kind of waited until it was too late to object. Uh, they basically went, like, the next day and, 
you know, decided to object then or like waited until the trial was pretty much like underway uh, when they should have objected long before. So I feel like they did that because they thought he was guilty anyway. So I don't feel like his lawyers actually cared enough to like prove his innocence, you know. Even if they thought he was guilty, they still should have tried to prove his innocence or worse comes to worse, try and give him like a lesser sentence, but they didn't, you know. So there were three judges who listened to this request and it would be their decision that would set a precedent for future laws. So on one hand, Alcott, which is Charles's other lawyer, uh, he argued that this type of thing happened in a lot of cases, that the accused either wasn't able to object to certain things with enough time, or sometimes they weren't able to be present when they needed to be, and the trial would just continue, and the jury would be able to convict them anyway. Basically, like, let's just say Charles was sick, and he didn't go to that preliminary trial, he wouldn't have been able to plead his case because they just would have done stuff without him. Like, if that, if that makes sense. They don't need the... They felt like they didn't need the convicted to be there sometimes. And that kind of wasn't... It didn't bode well for, you know, the convicted person. So, But on the other hand, Breeden, which is the prosecutor... He tried to argue that if they allowed this particular retrial to be granted, anyone else would be able to challenge the jurors, even if nothing was wrong initially. Like, they would just be able to pick anything out of a hat, and it could turn into a le crazy legal battle, which I could personally see both sides. Obviously, we always want a fair trial for everyone, but we also don't want people to request a retrial for something that they don't actually deserve. Like, you know... They could say that a jury was going to plead him guilty no matter what, so he wants a retrial. Like, you know, for actual authentic reasons, yes, we should be able to object to that kind of stuff, but that's when you should object sooner, you know. Um, this is also just my understanding of this situation. I could have things completely wrong and ass backwards, but that's you know, how I understood it, so, um, either way, after both sides spoke their piece, it was determined that Charles would not get a retrial. Judges believed that Judge Chapman, who took care of Charles's actual trial, was in the right by dismissing his objections, and so Charles was sent to be hanged on February 20th. On the night of February 19th, uh, a Reverend Hamilton met with Charles to speak to him, and probably to get him to repent. But Charles did not. Instead, he pleaded his innocence and said that someday the world would believe they have wronged me. Hamilton came to see Charles the next day at 10 o'clock. They talked for hours until it was time to leave uh, the cell. He was made to walk behind the cart, which was carrying his coffin, accompanied by Reverend Hamilton and his lawyer, Alcott. Thousands upon thousands of people stood around this death parade and watched Charles as he led as he was led to the gallows. Uh, this walk took over an hour, and what's really like messed up about this was that they actually took a detour to the city graveyard where Nathaniel was killed. They hoped that Charles would repent or confess if he saw the location of the crime or his crime, supposedly, but he did not. Instead, he held his head high and stayed calm until he got to the gallows. <laughs> what I think's funny of it, the, like, the 1800s of it all is so theatrical. Like, I love it, but hate it at the same time. Uh, they just, like, explored so many ways to get this man to confess, and it just didn't work. Like, the reverend showed up, they drove him past the murder scene, which ends up being his like, final resting place and stuff, and, like, the lawmen trying to prove he was guilty by wanting bribe money, like, it's just the 1800s of it all, everything's so crooked, <laughs> but, so, Charles did a lot of stuff in the face of death. He tried to hold off the hanging for as long as he could, so that Judge, 
So that way Judge Chapman would be done working. And I'm not sure if that meant for like the day or like his term of service was up or something like that. Um, but he wanted to wait until he was done working so that Charles could demand to could be could demand to be set free. Uh, he began to read his statement. He literally asked like asked the people a bunch of different questions. And he just, like, tried to prolong, prolong this for as long as possible. But it didn't work. So, obviously, Charles Boyington was hanged that day. Uh, even as he was hung, people were split, basically 50-50. Did Charles kill Nathaniel Frost? What was the point? What point or purpose did he have to kill Frost? Money? Maybe. He was trying to escape Mobile on the same day that Nathaniel was murdered. And while that... Absolutely looks like he was on the run. Other people around him said that he was already planning to leave for other money troubles. Sadly, the dude just didn't give himself a good reputation at any angle. People saw him as a gambler and someone always look f looking for money or the next escape. So now we're going to jump to the whole reason why we're talking about this case. So, it was reported that when Charles died... He told people that an oak tree would grow on his grave, and when it did, that would prove his innocence. Um, obviously, I'm not sure how long it took to grow, but eventually, where, right where Charles is buried, a large oak tree began to grow. Surprisingly, Charles was buried in Church Street Graveyard, which, as far as I know, just so happens to be the same location Nathaniel was murdered in. Which, for some reason, is really wild to me. Like, it's just crazy that he ended up being buried the same place where Nathaniel died. And I'm probably assuming that Nathaniel was probably buried in that graveyard too. So, it, it's just crazy. So, next to this large oak tree, there's a little plaque that reads, In 1835... Charles Boyington unjustly hanged for a friend's murder, predicted, predicted that an oak tree would grow from his heart to prove his innocence. So, just when you think we're done with this tale, things get a little bit more spicier. So, 12 whole years after Charles is hanging, we get a possible deathbed confession, which, side note, I have a love-hate relationship with death, deathbed <laughs> deathbed confessions honestly i'm sure a lot of people do i think it's just really fucked up that like serial killers murderers hell even like kidnapper kidnappers and shit literally wait until they're dying and the law can't do anything to them before they spill the beans like the love aspect of this is i guess like obviously we do end up getting the answers that we're looking for but it's just sad that, like, we have to wait so long for them to give it up, if they even do. Sometimes death, death happens so quickly that they don't even get a chance to tell anyone everything. And when they do, like I said, you, you can't punish them for this crime because they're dying. So, it just sucks. I mean, like, especially in this case where there was possibly an innocent man hung. This guy went on to live his life while Charles died, you know. Um, I feel like this is probably something that we can all agree with, that it's like a love-hate relationship. But anyway, according to an article titled Wrong Man Hung from the Evening Journal, which is a news, which is a New York newspaper, supposedly the landlord that owns Charles and Nathaniel's room, a.k.a. Captain George, was on his deathbed confessing to the murder. I found this article that I think is, is the article, and this is what it says. The Wrong Man Hung, a young printer named Boyington who served his time in the office of the New Haven Palladium, was hung a few years since in Alabama upon a charge of having murdered a companion with whom he was traveling. He protested his innocence to the last, but without avail. Recently, the landlord whose house the murder was committed confessed the crime on his deathbed, 
Boynton was a young man of fine talents and prepossessing appearance, whose guilt was deemed conclusive only from the fact that he was the last person to be seen with the murdered man. So it's weird that just this one article from a New York newspaper is the only is the only article ever mentioning this. I feel like if it were true and the rumor that they hung the wrong man was spread, a lot more people would have been up at arms or at very or at very least it would have been mentioned in a mobile newspaper. I mean, wouldn't it? This would actually make sense because Captain George was very against Charles and wanted him hung almost immediately. Was he was it because he was trying to hide something of his own doing? Um it could also explain why that lady who supposedly heard Charles and Nathaniel talking about picking berries in the graveyard suddenly disappeared too. I think her name was Miss Crichton, and she was a tenant of George's too, so maybe he threatened her in the silence. Um, there is something weird with this newspaper. Um, it does say that in whose house the murder was committed. I don't know if that, maybe that was just like the 1800s writing of it all. But it also sounds like he, they think that he was murdered in the house. So I'm wondering if maybe this was just like a, a bogus story to just bring in newspapers or something. Maybe. I don't know. It just does seem like that there's um some missing evidence but all in all there just isn't a lot of evidence to pull this case positively either way um i'm gonna be honest charles most definitely could have done this uh he most definitely could have killed nathaniel took the money and then spent the rest of the afternoon trying to escape mobile maybe he was just in a crazed and panic state so he just did everything possible to get out of town but why not just take the first horse you can get you can get and leave? I mean, he came back into town after leaving leaving with the rough hot riding horse. If he was really and I mean really trying to leave town, wouldn't he have just kept going? I don't know. And then there's the, also the fact that Nathaniel was stabbed a few times and Charles supposedly didn't have any blood on him at all. No one saw any blood on him. He was clean. I mean, I guess it's somewhat possible, but at the same time, you would think that anyone getting stabbed or whatnot is going to try and fight back. I know Nathaniel was ill, but I can't imagine him not trying to fight back at all. Um, like, how did Charles get the knife from Nathaniel? Because it was Nathaniel's whittling knife, so... That means he had it on his person, not Charles. So, there would have had to been some kind of struggle. You know what I mean? I really don't know the answer to this mystery. I can't even give you my opinion on if I think Charles did it or not. Part of me thinks he didn't do it just because he was so adamant towards the end of his life about trying to get off. Now, that could just most definitely mean that he was just like a killer trying to escape punishment. But I feel like at some point in time, he would have just given up. Like, I think he would have known that he was defeated, but maybe not. Maybe he just thought, like, oh, I'm going to get away with this no matter what. But, so what do you guys think? Do you think Charles is guilty? Do you think he's innocent? If you don't think Charles killed Nathaniel, who do you think did it? And also, definitely Google the tree. It's a beautiful, huge oak tree. Supposedly, here's the haunted part, if you visit the tree at night, you can hear crying and whispering coming from the tree itself. I wonder if that is still Charles pleading his innocence. The world may never know. I think it's funny that this tree is called a haunted tree, but the actual legend behind the tree is so much more interesting. If it is haunted, it would be so creepy to hear a tree crying in the middle of the night, but the history of it, of, like... Its origin is just so, so much darker. And if you have ever been in Alabama in that cemetery at night and have experienced any kind of paranormal stuff, I would love to hear your story. So please, you can email me at thehauntedcafe at gmail.com 
or you can put it in the comment section on YouTube. I would love to hear how spooky this tree actually is at night. Or how the graveyard is at night. Because it's right next to a graveyard. I think at one point in time, the tree actually was in it. But then they built a, a wall around it, a stone wall. So I don't know if maybe they specifically cut Charles and the tree out of the graveyard. Or if that's just how it worked somehow. But anyway, let me know what you guys think of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it. Comment if you think Charles is guilty or innocent or just what you think happened in general. And then finally, please subscribe if you want to hear more spooky stories from the Haunted Cafe. Thank you so much and we'll see you in the next time.